So welcome everyone. I know that people are still piling in. There are 70 people visiting currently and more still coming. So thank you all for um, such a, a wonderful audience coming out on this evening. And thank you especially for joining us on what turns out to be the eve of the historic verdict, uh, finding Derek Chauvin guilty of the murder of George Floyd. And um, so soon also before here in Knoxville, the funeral for Austin East student, Anthony Thompson Jr. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Tina Shepherdson. I'm the head of the Department of Religious Studies. And I'm joined here by two of my current colleagues um, who will moderate the Q&A um, discu and discussion after John's talk. Um, so they are Dr. Shayla Nunnally, Professor of Political Science and Chair of our Africana Studies program here at UT, and Dr. Larry Perry, Assistant Professor in both Religious Studies and Africana Studies. Both of these colleagues new to campus in August, and we're both thrilled, we're all thrilled to have um, both of you here. So welcome. So tonight's program is co-sponsored um, by both um, by both uh, Hold on a second. Um, Co-sponsored by both Religious Studies and Africana Studies. And, um, and so now it's my great pleasure to say a little about our guest of honor for the evening. John O. Hodges, John Oliver Hodges, was born in the Mississippi Delta town of Greenwood, where he attended segregated schools and graduated as valedictorian of his high school in 1963. He won a full tuition scholarship to attend Morehouse College, where he was an honors student and received a Merrill Scholar to study in France. John received a master's degree first in English from Atlanta University, and then a master's and PhD in religion and literature from the University of Chicago's Divinity School. After teaching English at, uh, at the, in the English department at Barat College, where he also served as chair of African American studies, he then, thanks, thankfully for us, accepted a position at the University of Tennessee in 1982 and worked there here until his retirement in 2010. While at UT, he served on many, many, many committees, including the Faculty Senate, the Athletics Board, the Editorial Board of the University Press, among many others. And he was recognized most profoundly as an outstanding teacher, including by the UT National Alumni Association, and numerous other teaching and service awards, uh, including the very prestigious Lorraine Lester Award for distinguished service to the university. John has traveled throughout Europe, throughout West Africa. He's lectured on African-American religion uh, in China. He's published articles in numerous journals, including the Langston Hughes Review, uh, Southern Quarterly, Soundings, and of course, his book, Delta Fragments, the Recollections of a Sharecropper's Son, which many of you probably have already seen, um, published with U uh, UT Press, details his experiences as growing up in the Mississippi Delta during the 1950s and 1960s. John is currently working on a book called Passion and Compassion, which deals with his quest to receive higher education at the height of the struggle for civil rights in the 1960s and early 1970s. He and his wife, Carolyn, emerita professor at UT, as well as former dean and former vice provost, have been just wonderful colleagues and friends to so many of us here on campus and here in the Knoxville community. John was one of the first people to welcome me to campus in 2003, and definitely the first person to take me to a home football game in Neyland Stadium, a memory I will always treasure. Uh, it was such a wonderful experience. I've always been grateful for John's generosity, your love of teaching, John, and your enormous big heart. And so now it is my very great pleasure to hand this over to my former colleague, my current board member, and my friend for nearly 20 years, Dr. John Hodges for his talk, Civil Rights from the Perspective of a Sharecropper's Son. And I'll just say briefly, uh, you can always uh, att attendees, you can always put comments in the chat. Also, you can submit comments and questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And Dr. Nunnally and Dr. Perry will moderate those questions and conversation when John is finished speaking. So thank you. And John, I look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Shepherdson. And thank you for your leadership. 
of Religious Studies. And thank you to the many of you, uh, my friends, who have joined us by way of webinar. Uh, this is a very important, significant day. And I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to be with me today. I'm honored by your presence to hear me talk about my experiences as a boy growing up in the Delta, Greenwood, Mississippi. I came to the university in 1982. It was the year of the World's Fair. Kellen and I came with our son, Daniel, who was 14 months at the time. Um, since then, Daniel has had many birthdays. <laughs> He celebrated his 40th birthday, and now he has a daughter of his own. So I'm very proud of Daniel. Though he did not follow us into the field of teaching, he chose a very important and noble profession as computer engineer. And he was recently promoted to vice president of engineering for the company that he works for. So we're very proud of our baby who has now become a man. Many of you know of the good work of Carolyn who retired in 2019 as vice provost emerita and professor of German emerita. She was inducted into the African American Hall of Fame at UT in 2019. I retired in December of 2010, but have remained active in the affairs of religious studies and the College of Arts and Sciences since then. The focus of my talk to you is my early life in the Delta my struggle there to get an education under the doctrine of separate but equal. I will talk about my involvement in the voter registration campaign as a teenager. You will hear of Emmett Till, learn of the martyrdom of George, Reverend George Lee and Megger Evans and of the courage of Fannie Lou Hamer and John Lewis. The cover of my book, which you will see uh, next, um, pictures, yes, okay. Uh, it pictures my move from the Delta in the upper portion, portion you see there to my class, I want to say 218 McClung Tower. I believe this picture was taken around 1996. It is a move from, if you will, the flatlands of the Delta to the hills of Tennessee. From the cotton fields, if you will, to the classroom. Now I've made several important stops between uh, the Delta and ended up at the uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. And this is a school of, uh, I want to say George Mitchell, who is from Greenwood. And I know that many would know George. Uh, he, I learned something about him that he played a little football when he was at Morehouse. <laughs> uh, and of my work in, um, from, uh, from Atlanta, I went to Nantes, uh, where I met some very wonderful uh, people. Uh, I had a chance to meet, for instance, uh, 
Kathleen uh, Kirvin Diamond at now, and Pat uh, Murphy Smith, and Alan Amber. And of course, I went with uh, uh, Ransom and uh, and uh, Bob Ross, Robert Ross. So I have enjoyed my experiences at uh, there in France, but I came back to Morehouse and Atlanta University. I went there and uh, from Atlanta University, I went to the University of Chicago. I spent uh, short uh, summers at Princeton at Yale. And I have grown from each of these experiences. But the Delta is my home. It served for me motivation and inspiration. It is foundational, foundational to all I would do and become. Going to school for me was a much better option than going to the fields. I've talked about the Delta, but what really is and where is the Delta? The Delta is located in the Northwestern part of the state. David Cohn, Cohn who is uh, from uh, the Delta himself, once said that it begins in the lobby of the Peabody Hotel in Memphis and ends on Catfish Row in Vicksburg. It was called by the historian James Cobb, the most Southern place on earth. It's the most Southern place because you see in the Delta, things die, stay on, traditions die hard you can see a little bit of the Old South, I should say a lot of the Old South, in the New South. So is, it does, things there seem not to change very much. The Delta, we can go to the next slide, <clears throat> known for its high production of cotton, soybeans, and some wonderful catfish and the blues. You have such blues artists as Robert Johnson and May Waters and John Lee Hooker and B.B. King. But the Delta is also one of the poorest regions in the country. It is the poorest region of the poorest state in the country. That is made clear by the video, which you will now see. We will play just a, a minute, or, minute and a half or so of the video. Right, okay. Uh, let's see. Unmute it, the video. Okay, there you go. I encountered the issue of third world poverty in the United States while driving across the country with my father and best friend last summer. In California to Maine, my father and I drove through 27 states in eight weeks. However, there was one region of the country that stuck with me over any other. The region is called the Mississippi Delta. The area is not actually a delta, but rather a rich and fertile alluvial plain created by thousands of years of flooding. The delta is located primarily in Mississippi, but also includes parts of Louisiana and Arkansas. Historically, the region was famous for having the most fertile cotton growing areas in the United States while at the same time producing some of the world's best blues and jazz musicians. You know you've done me wrong, baby. I 
and you'll be sorry someday. Sadly today, because of a number of factors that I will explore later, Mississippi Delta remains the poorest region of the United States. Having traveled in some of the poorest countries in the world already, such as Bangladesh and Cambodia, I was completely shocked to find conditions that would not be out of place in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. Why do such high levels of poverty persist today? Why are they concentrated in this geographic location? Why is this problem largely ignored by U.S. politicians, NGOs, and INGOs? And what is being done to help the situation? Most importantly, if we, as a first world country, are willing to spend millions overseas in nation building, why can't we eliminate third world poverty at home? To help me answer some of these questions, I interviewed a man named John Elsie. All right. Um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> moving from the Delta, I want to uh, later on uh, play a video of Greenwood, but I won't do it now. Uh, we'll do it later. I want to introduce it first. Actually, I the first memory of living in this area is on living on a plantation, the Whittington Plantation just outside of the city. Here I spent my earliest years as a sharecropper's son. I recorded the footage of Greenwood. I came to the city about uh, when I was about 12 years of age. I recorded this in, uh, I think around 1989. So you'll forgive me if I didn't have a smart camera then and could not, I uh, have good footage. I added Pop Staples, who is from uh, Mississippi. He's from Monona, Mississippi, somewhat later. You will see some of downtown Greenwood, the Keesler Bridge, which serves as a color line, dividing the black community from the white. Now you will note that most cities have a kind of color line that divide uh, blacks from white, uh, divide uh, the have nots from the haves. Uh, so the Keesler Bridge serves as a kind of color line. It may be a bridge or a railroad track, or a street, or a creek. But there is some, in general, every city, there is something that uh, separates uh, the black and white communities. Two different worlds, which never really meet, it seems, as Richard Wright once said, except in violence. Now you will note uh, that the music will stop as we go into North Greenwood because North Greenwood doesn't have any blues. Uh, but the blues will pick up as we come back uh, into the black neighborhood. And this becomes very personal for me because you will see my elementary school, my barber shop, the church I went to, even the street that I used to live on. But given the disparities between the wealthiest and poorest, and I was among the poorest, I never considered myself as being poor. So, I want you to keep this in mind as we now play the tape.
Now, uh, perhaps the most significant event of my childhood mm -hmm. was the lynching of Emmett Till in August of 1955 in Miami, Mississippi, which is about um, 11 or so miles from Greenwood. This 14-year-old teenager visited his great uncle there in Money, Mississippi, and a number of his, of his cousins. He was accused of whistling at Carolyn Bryant, who was the wife of the owner of the store. He was kidnapped later and shot in the head. His body was so disfigured that he could be recognized only by a ring on his finger. He was thrown in the Tallahatchie River, the gin fan secured by barbed wire around his head so that the body would sink. His body was found a few days later by a fish fisherman. The perpetrators of this act, Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Malam, were acquitted by an all-white jury. We see air in the next slide. Yes, his mother grieving by the casket. It was her decision to have uh, the casket open for the funeral so that the world would see what these two men had done to her son. The Emmett Till case had a great impact on me, as we see in the next slide. There you see Emmett Till, who was 14 at the time. I was 11. But my mother pleaded with me not to let what happened to Emmett Till happen to me. So I think that maybe she even, I know she scolded me. She may have even whipped me uh, because she was so afraid that of what would happen if I confronted a white woman. Okay. So the South in general, as I say in the next slide, yes. I wanna move now to the, the era of civil rights that I was involved in 1962 and 1963. It, it will be noted that I was involved only for about one year and one summer, but it was an intense summer. I was in, in the 11th grade at the time and I can remember going to Broad Street School, which was segregated. Um, we had, uh, it was indeed separate, but it was unequal. Uh, we had inferior gym equipment and laboratory equipment. The books were used books, but the teachers pay, which hurt me a great deal later was not equal at, at all equal. The black teachers earned much less than the white teachers and they worked harder. But let the record be known, they were some very good teachers and they prepared us very well with what they had. Okay, as we move, oh yes. <clears throat> now during this uh, uh, time, we were living on the separate but equal. Uh, we wanted to make sure, our fathers made sure, our mothers made sure that we would receive the education 
that was denied to them. And I know that many members of my class of 1963 and of my schoolmates in different classes made a number of sacrifices themselves so that their children would do much better than they did. I, so I'm pleased for that. As we move on, you can see, yes, that everything during this time was separate. It was separate and unequal. Much less was spent on the education of black children than white children. It was very expensive to run a dual school system. So uh, segregation was not only evil and, and uh, absurd, it was also very expensive. But as we see in the next slide, Uh, this is the Brown versus the Board of Education. But it was such a momentous decision. Uh, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Well, the NAACP had a decision to make. They could challenge that things were not equal and they should be made equal. Or they could hit on directly the notion of separation, which they decided to do. It Separation has in the minority child, the minority child feels that he or she is inferior. But you will note here that the ruling does not say anything about implementation. This was decided a year later in what is called Brown II. And the decision that was given then with all delivered speed. Now, <laughs> what does this in fact mean? So after a while, many people said that there has been too much deliberation and not nearly enough speed. You see, I graduated in 1963 and the school system was not integrated then. And it is probably, I should say, definitely not integrated today. Blacks go to a public school that is about 95 or more percent Black. Now, <clears throat> why is this so? A lot of this is owing to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, um, which was established in 1956 to protect the sovereignty of the state of Mississippi and sister states from the encroachment thereon by the federal government. It fought integration and black efforts to vote. Now these two concerns, concerns were voiced uh, by the racist utterance of the manager of a Coca-Cola plant in Belzona. I will read his views and will say that um, uh, where he uses uh, the N word, I will just use Negro, okay? He said that Integration leads to intermarriage. If my daughter 
starts going to school with Negroes now, by the time she gets to college, she won't think anything of dating one of them. The Negro's life consists of sex, eating, and drinking. And he goes on to make this comment about voting. This town, Bob Bell, he's talking about Belzona, is 70% Negro. If the Negro voted, there'd be Negro candidates in office and that they could not stand. So let's move now to the issue of voting that we see in the next slide. <clears throat> well, the 15th Amendment gave Black citizens, Blacks, the right <laughs> to vote, Black men. All women uh, did not vote until 1920, you know, 50 years later. But at that time, there were still reasons that the Black men could not vote. What then were some of the non-racial reasons that we will note in the slide next? Grandfather clauses and poll taxes and literacy tests, they were legal ways to deny Blacks the right to vote. The grandfather clause said, well, you can vote if your grandfather could vote. Well, and if you paid a certain poll tax, of, I believe it was $2. Now $2 was a lot of money when I came along. I, worked, I remember working a whole day for $2. And the literacy test had to be uh, passed to the satisfaction of uh, a white register, registrar. So blacks were still not able to vote. And as we see in the next slide, uh, there were uh, intimidations and reprisals by, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan, which was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1865. Now the Klan made it very difficult and uh, dangerous for blacks to even attempt to vote. And I don't have uh, any joy in saying that I don't think that I, I'm pretty sure my mother and stepfather never voted. Okay, never did vote. Okay, um, let's, the, George W. Lee, Reverend George Lee um, preached from his pulpit, he encouraged black to register to vote, but he was killed um, in, on May 7th, 1955, by, when a gunman shot him in the face three times and he was forced off the road and he died as a result. And in the next side, side, slide, you see Megar Evers, who uh, was field secretary of the NAACP. Many of us worked with Megar Evers in Greenwood because he came uh, to Greenwood to work with us. We were in the uh, youth chapter of the NAACP. And he stayed at um, Hotel Plaza, uh, George Mitchell knows what I'm talking about, uh, in, in Greenwood. We did not, when we met with him in his room there, we did not know that he, every move that he made was being watched. He was constantly watched by members of the Sovereignty Commission. And I, 
I, I, I want to say a little bit more about that uh, later on. In the next slide, you see Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was not killed. She died much too early uh, of breast cancer. She was only 59 years old. But she did lose her job in 1962 when she attempted to vote. She was beaten when she, one time that she was in jail by two black prisoners, young enough to be her children. You can imagine, I think, what it would be like to beat your mother. They were ordered to do so by the white officers. Fannie Lou Hamer, if you remember, was a member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party who challenged unsuccessfully to unseat the regular Democratic Party in 1964 in Atlantic City. Next, we see a life-size uh, statute in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer. What a worthy tribute. It was dedicated October 5th, 2012. Fannie Lou Hamer, you remember, said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, I was arrested, as we see in the next video, um, at the, the Raleigh rally in 1962 when Fannie Lou Hamer attempted it to vote unsuccessfully. You see uh, my name, John O. Hodges, and I, it says I was president of the student body. Uh, and the under my name is the name of a good friend, Albert Garner, who was the rising president of the senior class. We were, uh, found guilty of distributing handbills without a license. Now that may be on the book somewhere, but it was only used in this kind of case. It would be what Martin Luther King would call an unjust law. In the next slide, um, you see uh, the Court. We went to court in um, in Indianola, Mississippi, which is the county seat of Sunflower County. <laughs> I can remember that very well. Uh, we had one hundred white men who screamed at us all kinds of obscenities. We were called the N-word. And quite frankly, it I know it added on me the fact we were intimidated. It was meant to do that, to intimidate us. But all of this lead um, to our next slide, um, John Lewis on Bloody Sunday. Um, as part of the march from uh, Selma to Montgomery, John Lewis, the boy from Troy, <laughs> Troy, Alabama, uh, was 25 at the time. He had just turned uh, 25. A few minutes later, 
of his crossing the bridge, he would have his skull cracked. Now, uh, this led, all of this led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A very important act indeed. It was an act to enforce the 15th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States and of the purposes. The out act outlawed all tests and taxes required to vote. But as you know, this did not stop the efforts to keep Blacks from voting. And we see right uh, in the next slide, this assault continues even today in Georgia Senate Bill 202, where we know that the state officials can disqualify voters in democratic leaning areas. And they could criminalize providing food and water to those waiting in line to vote. This led to Johnson passing uh, this act, as said, as a result of Johnson's uh, passing this act. We know that there would be, and there are a number of issues um, related to voting, to restricting the vote. But in the enduring words of the civil rights movement and the words of President Johnson, as he pushed for the passage of the Voting Rights Acts, we shall overcome. And thank you very much. I will now turn this over to Tina, uh, Dr. Shepherdson, and Dr. Perry, and Dr. Nolly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hodges. Dr. Perry? One moment, I'm having an issue with the uh, video. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you, John, for that, that wonderful presentation. Um, I guess I can just start it off. Is that okay, Dr. Nindley? Okay, great. I guess what I'm trying to, um, you know, it, you know, we're, we're never that great at, at tooting our own horn, right? Um, you know, I mean, I think you kind of you kind of rushed a little bit through through what you were doing within that one year. Um, it's because I mean, for those that don't know, you know, Dr. Hodges was mentioned. He gets a mention in um, in um, I've got the light of freedom by Charles Payne. Yeah. So what we want to know, what I want to know is what led to you actually taking part in the movement, right? What was the impetus? What, what, what was the feeling like as a young man still in high school, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that takes a, a particular amount of courage, right, to, to take part in that. I would just want to know what, what, what encouraged you to do it. And um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was 1962, Robert Moses and Sam Block uh, uh, came along with others, came to Greenwood and they were trying to find the young people who would help them to register uh, uh, Blacks, to try to find Blacks to register to vote, not only in Greenwood, but throughout the Delta. And I must say that um, I must note here that not only myself and uh, uh, Albert Garner, but 
the Greens uh, uh, and many others were involved in this movement. And um, Reverend Johnson, who was a barber, was involved in the movement. One of the things we wanted to make sure that we were going to try to change things because we were not at all satisfied with what, where they were at the time. And so that gave me impetus. And I saw these uh, men who came to Greenwood and some of them who were part of the movement, they were in law school. And for that, I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to do something to make things, uh, to change things uh, uh, in Greenwood. That is one of the things that gave me uh, the impetus. And I must say <laughs> that uh, my teachers, they would say to me, hey, go John, you know. They could not say it out loud, but they could, they did say it to me. And this gave me uh, a lot of encouragement that I was doing the right thing. And thank you, Larry. Thank you for that uh, wonderful question. Uh, okay. And Dr. Hodges, we do have a question in the chat that asks, what is your view on modern voter identification laws that have been the focus of many politicians in America today? Now, I, I'm sorry, I don't, we, could you, could we bring you a little louder so I can hear what you're saying? Sure. Yeah, okay. What is your view on modern voter ID laws that have been the focus of many politicians in America today? Oh boy. <laughs> Those laws are passed just to suppress black voting, black and brown voting. Uh, <clears throat> many of the people are still upset over what happened in, in Georgia. Uh, it was meant to be, you know, a red state, but suddenly, Georgia this year, uh, thanks to uh, uh, people there, voted to, uh, for two Democrats and it became uh, blue. So those ID laws are simply meant to restrict black voting. There are many, I know my mother and father never had a proper ID. They never, because they, they didn't drive. Didn't need a driver's license because they didn't drive. Of course, you could have, uh, you know, other government IDs, but these voter identification laws are simply meant to suppress and restrict the votes of black and brown people. Great, great. So could you say a little bit more about how you're rearing, right? The reality that you faced in Greenwood kind of affected your outlook on scholarship, right? So you come to the field of, you know, American religion, I mean, African American religion, right, at a pivotal moment, right? So you're, you're part of like this generation just after, um, just after your, your, your advisor, Nathan Scott, right? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't really write about race at all. But your generation, when I think about your generation, I think about the James Cones, the, the Charles Longs, the, um, the William R. Joneses, mm -hmm. right? Who, you know, deliberately spoke about race. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about what it was like for you 
as part of that generation to not leave Greenwood behind when you met the classroom. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm going to deal with in the book that I'm working on now. Um, how could someone uh, like Nathan Scott, an eminent scholar of theology, not be involved in black theology. Um, that uh, has concerned me uh, uh, to this day. But I would say that um, uh, he did uh, attend uh, the March um, of the of when they had the um, anniversary of the Selma March. He was there. He was he heeded the call to be there. It was simply not his style. Right. Um, but um, yes. I am dealing with that issue now uh, because it concerns me that um, my many of my professors, Charles Long and others, were very much involved with the movement in one way or the other. So they were interested in uh, the plight of Blacks. But Nathan Scott, well, he, he seems to want to deal with uh, other issues. Uh, um, is, I wanted to deal with what was more important to me. He didn't deal with, he could not understand where I came from. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I will leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. uh, he was... did not really understand where I came from. But now uh, you and many others do and bless you for that. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Dr. Hodges, actually someone is asking a question that I wanted to come back to the Dr. Perry question as far as your experience in high school. But here, Dr. Wardell Johnson asked you to talk about your teachers, Ms. Williams, Reverend Aaron Johnson, and oh, Ms. Yes. Perry, who impacted your life as a youngster. And this is coming from the nephew of Reverend Aaron Johnson. Ms. Perry and Ms. Williams, class of 1968, and June Johnson. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for that question. Uh, and Wardell, thank you. Uh, your uncle was a very important person in the movement, as you know. And he was one who wanted to make sure that his own daughter and son would have a fine education. And you know uh, that they did. Uh, Juanita and Paul, in fact, did. But my teachers were great. I can think of uh, Thomas D. Barnes and Solomon N. Outlaw. But especially, most especially, Leola G. Williams. She was very important in my life. And I will never forget what she did for us. She was perhaps uh, the smartest woman, a person I never really knew. <laughs> and I was, she was my uh, drama coach and uh, 
She also was the coach of Morgan Freeman, I should mention, and of Tonia Stewart, yeah, and, and many others. She was a very, very important uh, person in my life. And uh, I, I cannot thank her uh, for her sacrifice enough. Yes, I, I thank you very much for that, that question because uh, she was not paid what she should have been paid. And uh, her, her abilities um, were recognized. She went over to Delta State and, uh, and she re retired there uh, at Delta State. Okay. Cool. So I guess my question, my next question would be, um, what was the effects of like Morehouse College, right? Going to an HBCU during this era? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, you have- Oh, Larry. Yeah. It was very good because you are, you went to Fisk. Yes, right? I'll you. Don't worry. <laughs> God bless you for that. Uh, <laughs> we all went to HBCUs. And that was the great decision of my life to go to Morehouse College. I didn't have enough money to Morehouse College, and, but I said I would do all I can to stay at Morehouse. It meant the world to me uh, to go to an HBCU like Morehouse, like Fisk, uh, Howard University, Spelman College, and many more. Because they seemed to understand uh, what I had been through. And what I still was going through. So Morehouse College gave me every opportunity. And I am appreciative to dear old Morehouse today of the friends that I met there. I thought I was pretty good, uh, pretty smart when I graduated from uh, my school. But I, when I went to Morehouse, I found some other people were well, they were smart too. <laughs> so I really enjoyed growing with them, their fellowship, their company. And you know, from there, it has made all the difference in the world. And thanks very much for that question. Yes. As an alumna of North Carolina Central University, also an HBCU, I just had to mention my alma mater. Oh, well, uh <laughs> What did you say, Shayla? I said, as an, an alumna of North Carolina Central University. Hello, I hello. I just, uh, I just had to mention my alma mater in the conversation. Oh, yes, you should. <laughs> yes, you should. Absolutely. Because they have produced a very fine person in you. I know that. <laughs> and many others, I'm sure. Yes. I uh, wanted to acknowledge as well another question in the chat. And this one coming from our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean Teresa Lee, who asked, how did your mother react to you being involved in the civil rights movement? I can oh, imagine my. both pride and fear. How, <laughs> that is why I was involved only one summer because <clears throat> Absolutely, it was dangerous business. Uh, she would get on the phone. Uh, I put her in great jeopardy too. Um, remember, she had to work in Greenwood. She had a little job. And they would say to her, uh, you got to do something about your son. Okay. 
So in order to spare her, when I went to Morehouse, I never returned uh, to the Delta. I did some uh, marching in Atlanta, <laughs> uh, but it was not like being in Mississippi, in, in the Delta. So my mother was frightened as she should have been, as all mothers should have been, because I very well, very easily could have been a victim. I was followed, you see, by these members of the Sovereignty Commission, which was established, as I mentioned, in 1956, and was disbanded, disbanded uh, uh, in 1976 when they could not receive money, when the governor did not <laughs> vote to, to give them any more money. But what, let me say this about the Sovereignty Commission. It had broad powers of investigation and they would get into your credit history, your personal life. And uh, it was mentioned uh, that I did not read, uh, uh, but that uh, Bob Moses lived next door for a communist newspaper. They wanted to, to say that we were all communists at the time. So yes, uh, uh, this sovereignty commission absolutely ruined many people. But I would say that to the credit of so many others, they did not let that deter them. Reverend Aaron Johnson didn't let that deter him. He just kept on. And so many others who gave their churches for mass meetings you remember that uh, at that time, churches were being uh, burned and bombed that held mass meetings. So I would give a lot of credit to the local uh, people, but yes, they were afraid, but they did not let fear interfere with what they needed what they knew needed to be done. Cool. So Jody Madler is asking, how did your family react to your plan to study abroad? Was your return to the US difficult after this experience? When I said it abroad? Yep. <laughs> well, before I went to study abroad, People told my wife, you know, that boy is going to France and they drink a lot of wine there. So I told my mother, said, mom, they, the wine they use it, you know, for dinner, it's no big deal. So I did not promise her that I would not have wine there in France, you know. Imagine going to France and not enjoying uh, the wine. Uh, but uh, the experience in France, uh, was very pivotal in my life. It has brought my experiences of the Delta. Remember, I, I did not study with whites until I went to Morehouse. Maybe there had to, a few whites there who were enrolled there. But it was just until, uh, not until going to France that I had an opportunity to, to work with some wonderful individuals who are my friends even today. We were in plays together. And so that experience was very pivotal in my life. And it made a great difference. I, I must say that when I returned uh, from that experience, I was something of a snob. I thought everybody could should speak French as I did. I, I, 
I was, yes, something of a, a snob, I admit it. Uh, uh, some of my friends <laughs> would call me Frenchy because I would wear Tam and stuff. But I had played, uh, paid a lot to learn the language and I was not about to lose it <laughs> uh, when I came back to the United States. We have a question about where you think that people are as far as civil rights today, especially with respect to the Black community and civil rights. I think today, and let's, let's say, was a landmark day. And it was the day that I gave this presentation I would never forget that here for once, a jury found a, a white person guilty of all three charges. So that's, that, that's a very important. I was thinking when, uh, when talking about Emmett Till, I would say, yay. Emmett Hill, this one is for you and for so many other people. Uh, this verdict, and certainly there needs to be more, but it is a very important start in the right direction. And I am particular glorified that this happened um, that the jury uh, found him, uh, Chauvin, guilty of all charges. We know that we can trust our eyes that this man, Chauvin, had his knee on Floyd's neck for nine and a, and a half, almost in a half minutes. That's a long, long time. It's not enough, but we are moving in the right direction. And um, they used to ask uh, uh, John Lewis, and he went, uh, do you see any, any progress in it? And he would say, yes. He would be among the first to say there has been some progress, not enough. He would say, you will need to walk a mile in my shoes to see the progress that has been made. We no longer have the fountains black and, and of, I should say white and colored uh, uh, fountains. And many during my day would say, look, I, I want to drink a little bit from that, uh, from the white fountain and see how that water tastes, see if it tastes any different. So uh, uh, there has been, yes, some progress was not enough, but we keep marching. And let's hope that our children will not have to go through um, what we went through. And Dr. Hodges, I, I just want to also add for our audience just some of the, the layering of what happened with Emmett Till and the assailants in his case, um, his, in, in the case of his murder. And that is that you have an all white jury that is also instructed to do their job as Anglo Saxons yes. to make sure that the conviction was in the favor of, in essence, not guilty. Yes. And that they revealed after the trial that being found not guilty, that indeed they had committed the crime. And that's something for us to just think about 
what that day was in court for Emmett Till's murder. Oh, that, that must have been a very tough day. Uh, uh, I understand that the jury there uh, deliberated for less than an hour. They said, well, let's try to make it look good and we'll come back in an hour. The instruction to the jury was that your Anglo-Saxon forefather would roll over in that grave if you found this man, uh, these men guilty as charged. Now, so the day I say, yay for Emmett Hill. And for the many of men and women who have not uh, received the justice through the court, it was indeed a great, great day for all. Indeed, indeed. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, one moment. So Jolyn um, Cunningham um, would like for you to um, speak on the implications of school integration when many black um, children went to schools that were woefully limited in material resources, but had teachers who understood and would be were committed to them and were moved into schools that that had more money, material resources, but not necessarily with teachers who understood them, um, as well as may not have been as committed to them. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh boy. That's a real problem today. We have a number of white teachers in the school system, the public school system, who are making their living teaching black kids. And they probably try to do a good job, and I would say they probably they do a good job, but they don't have the same kind of feel. They do not know the kind of, uh, they do not know the experiences of the parents. Our teachers knew our parents and they knew what they were going through. Many of these white teachers today, they have their own children going to private academies. They do not send their own children to the public schools. So they do not have that support. It means that the public schools do not have the same kind of funding because it's based on a formula that deals with the number of students. And so if the white students are going to other academies, the public schools suffer. You know, uh, this whole issue is not going to be solved until we solve the issue, deal with the issue of integration. I, I wanted to say that uh, in the Brown case, uh, <clears throat> They talked about the black child may feel inferior. The how it hurts the black child. I would say only that it hurts children in general. Segregation hurts the white child who feels that for some reason that 
he or she is superior to the black child. So it doesn't just hurt the black child, but it hurts children, all children. Um, and there must be some way that we can deal with the problem. I, I probably would have been uh, enriched uh, by going to school with the whites. But I know very well they would be enriched by going to school with me and Albert Garner and Jeffy McNeil and a number of others and John Pleasant and Waddell Johnson and George Mitchell and, and many more. They missed out. They missed on an opportunity only because their fathers were afraid that their daughters would become somehow involved with a black person. Uh, you're muted, um, Jill. I'm reviewing some of the comments and I'm seeing um, one of the questions actually asked about Greenwood today. How is Greenwood, Mississippi today? You, you know, I probably don't have my volume turned up uh, loud enough. And right now, I'm not sure how this would work. Um, so I don't hear you very well. The question was, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, the question was, um, how is Greenwood today compared to where it was before? <laughs> Unfortunately, Greenwood still is not in a very good place. Um, we have too much um, gang violence for one thing. Uh, the education system is not what it needs to be. It should be better. Um, it's not the, the, the lowest in education, but it's pretty near the bottom. So Greenwood has not changed very much. Let me give you um, an example. Um, I was invited to Greenwood to give a talk about my book. Uh, I had hoped to use this occasion uh, that whites and blacks would get together and we would talk about you know, matters, uh, how we could solve this issue. Um, that is facing the Delta. Uh, but you know, no white person attended that book reading. They just passed by and saw uh, a number of black people. It was there, it was held uh, in the one great bookstore in Greenwood, but no one attended. So um, I am concerned uh, that there is not the interest of, of whites and blacks to get together in a meaningful way to deal with the issues. Um, I should say that um, um, when I was growing up in Greenwood, I knew of, uh, no black officials, but I understand that Greenwood has had in its past a black mayor, a black police chief. It was because of blacks voting. And uh, the gentleman was correct from Belzona by saying that it is 70% 70, 70 <laughs> 
or 75 percent blacks. And if we are not careful, he said, blacks are going to elect blacks to office. Although he did not use the word blacks or Negroes. Uh, that has pretty much happened, but it remains uh, poor because uh, many uh, people have moved outside of the city limits of Greenwood and they have, uh, they do not support the economy of Greenwood. So it remains very poor today. Right. Um, could you say a bit about your, can you hear me? What did you say, Larry? Uh, yeah, could yeah. you say a bit about your time at UT? What it was like in the classroom, what you taught, um, you know, things of that nature. And what, what was your experience like? Uh, when I taught in, uh, at the University of Tennessee, yes. That was a wonderful experience. Uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we're okay. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, <laughs> you know, the schedule <laughs> uh, were much better because it gave us more time to discuss the issues. I did not uh, shy, I brought my experience uh, uh, of living in the Delta to the classroom. I must say that many times I had to bite my tongue uh, what I heard uh, uh, some of my uh, white students listening to their parents say, oh, well, you know, oh, it's not really bad. Uh, you know, look at him, yeah? How can we say that it is bad? Well, it was bad. And the only reason that I made it, that so many of us made it, was because of our teachers, the black church, uh, of which I am sometimes critical, I must say. Uh, but, you know, we made it and we want, because of the teachers, and we want to give the same to our, our own students. So it was a pleasure for me to teach uh, in the classroom at the University of Tennessee. I liked teaching so much, you know, that I forgot that I, I needed to do more research as well. <laughs> but I really enjoyed uh, uh, teaching my classes at the university. And Dr. Hodges, I know we're nearing a time where we're, we will be coming to an end, but I just wanted to ask whether you had a take home message for us in light of all of your life's experiences, what would be your take home message to us? Well, I would say that we must never give up the struggle, all the struggle. We must continue in the words of uh, the late John Robert Lewis, find ways to get in good trouble. Um, we must make this country what we know that it should and can be for everyone. And that would be uh, uh, my message to, to today. And, um, I would say thank you and thank everyone for your listening in my stumbling way uh, to tell of my past, of my growing up in Delta, and how that has shaped my outlook on things, how it has motivated me uh, to be the kind of teacher, passionate and compassionate that I am. And I thank you. 
Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. And thank you, my colleagues, Larry, Shayla. Um, thanks to everyone who has come and attended. We had 100 guests at one point um, for, mo for much of the, the lecture. So um, thank you all so much. And I, I believe that John is able to hang around a little if there are a couple of friends or family or people who are wanting to say hi. But um, this concludes otherwise our, our evening. And I just want to Thank you all. Um, John hasn't yet seen the chat comments, but I promise to save the chat and bring those to him um, so that he will see all of your uh, comments to him through the evening. So thank you all so much. Any other comments from any of the others um, on the panel? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. This is great. All right. Thank you so much, John. And let me say thank you to uh, Dr. Nunnally and Dr. Perry. Thank you very much. Thank you. This did is an excellent job of bringing out what I wanted to say. And thank you for that. <laughs> thank you.